ever felt frustrated because your photos just don't look the way you want them to? You're definitely not alone. We've all been there missing out on those perfect shots that we can just never get back. So let's put an end to that today. In this video, I'll reveal the crucial settings that work like magic regardless of the brand that you're using, ensuring that you will never miss another moment. Plus, I'll unveil the single most vital skill that every wildlife photographer needs. Stick around because mastering this skill could transform your photography overnight. The first big decision we have to make as birds and wildlife photographers when we look at our camera is to pick the right shooting mode. And the most common modes for us nature photographers are probably aperture priority, manual mode and auto ISO, or full manual mode. In the end, there's definitely no right or wrong when it comes to the shooting mode, and you should just select the one that works the best for you, but gaining more control over your camera and using more and more modes that are kind of more manual definitely makes sense, because the more control you gain over the camera, the better your images will ultimately be. Because with all the automatic modes, you're always leaving a bit of guessing up to the camera, whereas if you're shooting in full manual mode, for instance, all the control over the camera and your images is up to you. Now, it being up to you can be quite scary sometimes and will feel overwhelming at times, especially in the beginning. So using some of the more automatic modes can also make sense to kind of ease in into the process and not having to change your settings constantly. In the past, the most commonly used mode, especially before auto ISO came around, is definitely aperture priority. In aperture priority, you set the ISO and the aperture, for instance, f5.6 and ISO 800, and then the camera will pick the right shutter speed according to what it's metering with its metering system and the two other inputs that you've put in. Now this can work very well, but at times the camera will get it wrong because the metering will just not meter the scene how you want to present it. And in that case, you also have the exposure compensation available where you can either dial in negative stops or positive stops, telling the camera that it should either overexpose or underexpose the scene based on its metering. In the past, I've been using aperture priority a fair bit and it's definitely given me good results, but at times the camera can get confused and give you dramatically too fast or to slow shutter speeds resulting in over or underexposed images, but overall it's a pretty reliable mode. And these days you can also combine it with auto ISO, allowing the camera basically to set the ISO and the shutter speed for you, so you only set the aperture. But then I think there's other modes that are a little bit more advanced now that allow you to have a bit more control over the camera, because if you're only setting the aperture, you're leaving a lot of guesswork up to the camera, and I think that's not great, and you're almost shooting in full automatic mode then. One mode that kind of sounds manual, but it's still an automatic mode, is manual mode on auto ISO. And I think this is one mode that most people use these days. And in that mode, you are setting the aperture and the shutter speed yourself, and then allowing the camera to adjust the ISO to give you a good exposure. If you don't want to shoot full manual mode, this is probably the way to go. And because you're setting the aperture and the shutter speed yourself, you're actually exercising a lot of control over the camera. The only issue you can possibly run into with this mode is if your ISO range for the auto ISO is maxed out either on the high end or the low end, with your scene either being too bright or too dark. If the camera can't adjust the ISO enough to actually adjust to the settings that you've dialed in, you may get severely over or underexposed images, but if you make sure that your settings kind of match what you're seeing in the field, I think using manual mode and auto eyes is also a very good way to go and helps you in the field if the light changes, for instance. Just like with aperture priority, with manual and auto eyes, you also have the ability to use exposure compensation, telling your camera to either overexpose or underexpose a certain scene. For instance, if you're out in the snow and everything is very bright, it's very likely that your camera will tend to underexpose small shots. So in this case, you would dial in a positive exposure compensation and get better and brighter looking shots. Personally, over the last 10 years or so, I've only been shooting in full manual mode, giving me full control over the camera by setting ISO, shutter speed, and aperture myself. Now that's definitely a daunting task and not always easy, but at the same time, it has also never been easier to actually use full manual mode because we have all these little helpers in our modern mirrorless cameras. For instance, we can see the histogram in the viewfinder and we can also get the exposure simulation in the viewfinder instantly showing us if the scene is too bright or too dark in the viewfinder. So actually getting it fully wrong with full manual mode is very difficult these days. The biggest advantage of full manual mode is obviously that we have full control over the camera. We set an exposure, for instance, for a bird flying against the blue sky, and when it now suddenly flies against a different darker color background, we still have the correct exposure on the bird. Whereas if we're having one of the more automatic shooting modes, it's very likely that at some stage 
you'll get a few too dark or too bright images when your background changes completely. What's the shooting mode most of you guys are using? Aperture priority, manual and auto ISO, full manual, or maybe even FV mode on Canon, a kind of a mix of all the modes? Let me know in the comments. One thing I get asked a lot is what metering mode are you using on your camera? There isn't necessarily the one perfect metering mode, but the one that I would recommend for most people and that generally gives me the best results in the field as well is the evaluative metering mode. I think with Nikon it's called matrix metering and with Sony it's called multi-pattern metering. Basically where the camera measures all over your viewfinder and then tries to find the perfect exposure for you. And unless you're shooting in very extreme cases, this should give you good results most of the time. And then in combination with the exposure compensation, you should be able to easily get the right exposure 99% of the time. If you're shooting in very extreme cases, for instance, if you're having a very dark subject against a very bright background, to get the right exposure on the subject, you might want to use something like the spot metering. However, in this scenario, it's quite likely that you will now blow out your background completely because the camera will only meet at a dark subject and adjust the settings according to that, letting the very bright background blow out completely. So if you want that, then it's good. Other times, I still think it's better in this case to either shoot in full manual mode to have the control over the background and your subject, or use the evaluative metering mode and then adjust the exposure compensation accordingly to get the just the right exposure. So when it comes to the metering mode, I would always recommend to use the evaluative metering that kind of measures the whole scene, unless you're shooting something dramatic, or even better, you use full manual mode because then the metering mode doesn't matter at all because you're in full control and not letting the camera guess what you actually want to meter or how you want to expose your scene. There's one setting that's single-handedly responsible for almost all ruined photos, and that's your shutter speed. If you get your shutter speed wrong, the chances that your photos will be ruined is very high. If your shutter speed is too low for a given scene, you usually end up with either too bright or very blurry images. And if your shutter speed is too high, you might freeze the action, but at the same time, you'll often end up with severely underexposed images that are then very hard to edit later on because you have to pull them up a lot and then you're adding a lot of noise to the images and you're degrading your image quality. So nailing the shutter speed is crucially important. And now that we're on the way to taking amazing images in the field, I think it's also important that you learn how to edit them properly to get the most out of them and make them truly shine. And I would love to help you to do that with my masterclass, my pro sets and my brush pack. With my pro sets, I allow you just one click to transform your raw files. With my brush pack, I make your life in Photoshop a lot easier. And in my masterclass, I teach you everything else you need to know in Photoshop to get amazing results. And I do that step by step so you can easily follow along. This will not only give you better results, but also makes you much more confident when it comes to image editing. So if that's of interest to you, make sure to check this out down there in the description. So what is the correct shutter speed then, Jan? Well, that's not actually that easy to answer because it depends on two factors. First of all, what are you photographing? And secondly, where are you photographing? Are you photographing something that's moving fast or a singing bird or hopping kangaroo? Or are you photographing something still that's just sitting there and not moving a lot? And secondly, are you photographing like in bright sunlight or are you photographing in a dark rainforest? Personally, I always like to err on the side of caution when it comes to shutter speed and rather have much too high shutter speeds than too low shutter speeds. So I only ever use low shutter speeds when I'm in a very dark environment because it kind of forces my hand and the only way to get a well exposed image is to have a slow shutter speed. But in all other cases, I usually dial in a quite high shutter speed allowing me to freeze the action whenever it happens. Because let's be honest, the best photos we take in usually happen when something happens in our frame. If a bird takes off, if a few birds lands on our image, if a kangaroo starts hopping over a fence, or all these kind of things. And with the only chance we have to freeze this kind of action is if we're prepared by having a high enough shutter speed dialed in already. And sometimes it can be deceiving because you might be standing in front of a bird and it's just sort of sitting there not doing much. But then suddenly a second bird might enter the scene and if you have a too slow shutter speed dialed in because you thought the bird was just sitting there, you'll likely get only blurry images and miss a great scene. So ideally I like to have a shutter speed dialed in that allows me to capture any unforeseen action the moment it happens. So my go-to would be between like a 640th of a second and a 1250th of a second. You don't want to have it too high because that means you have to use very high ISOs and that degrades image quality. But at the same time, if you have a too low under 400th of a second, chances are that a lot of your images will be blurry the moment 
your subject moves just a tiny bit. So I definitely don't like to be under 400th of a second and much prefer to be around an 800th of a second if I don't expect too much action. And if I expect action, I definitely want to be above a 2000th of a second. And if I'm shooting birds in flight or I know I will only shoot action, ideally I like to be above a 4000th of a second. Hand in hand with the shutter speed also goes the right ISO setting. And for decades we have been told we should be using as low ISOs as possible. Now in theory this is right, but at the same time this is also the single most reason that a lot of images have been ruined over the last few decades because people use ISOs like 200 or 400 that gives them quite low shutter speeds in return. And then whenever something happens in your frame, you get a blurry shot or you get an overexposed image. So using your ISO wisely is very important. And by wisely, I mean using a high enough ISO. In these days, we definitely don't have to be afraid anymore of using ISOs like 1600, 3200, 6400. There's amazing helpers around these noise reduction softwares that allow us to easily get rid of the noise and still have a nice and sharp and good looking image. Whereas if we're using a too low ISO, we might have a noise free image Image, but it's blurry and you can fix noisy but you can't fix blurry so when it comes to the ISO it's definitely important to set it high enough and I rather have it a little bit higher than a little bit too low so my goal to ISO settings most of the time especially because I shoot a lot of overcast conditions is probably ISO 1600 if it's sunny I go to 800 and if it's crazy sunny I might sometimes go to ISO 400 but I almost never do that and if it gets a bit darker, I definitely don't have a problem going to ISO 3200, 6400, or even 12800. These days, you can definitely still get amazing results with like Topaz D Noise Dix or Puro or Adobe Enhance. So don't be afraid of high ISOs. You will thank me later because instead of having blurry images, you will have fantastic looking high ISO sharp images. We have another very important setting on our camera, and that is the aperture that basically determines how much light comes through the lens onto your sensor. Now I know that a lot of people like to shoot always wide open on their lens at like f2.8, f4, f5.6, depending on the lens, but I think this is a big mistake. Of course, you get the most light on your sensor and you also get nice and smooth backgrounds, but at the same time, you're neglecting something that's called depth of field. If you're shooting wide open with your lens, you have very narrow depth of field, often just a few millimeters if you're using a long telephoto lens. And your only way to get more of your subject in focus is to actually stop your lens down. If you have an F4 lens, you for instance stop it down to F8 and that significantly increases the depth of field on your subject. Now how much you should stop down or maybe not stop down at all also depends on what you're shooting and how close you are to your subject. If you're very close to a small bird like a hummingbird, your depth of field is narrow, so stopping down there will help you a lot and your background will also still look nice. But if you're shooting like a large mammal, a deer for instance, that's a bit further away from you in a field, then shooting wide open will often give you still enough depth of field. So the closer your subject, the more you should stop down and the further away your subject, you actually don't have to stop down as much because you have more depth of field naturally because the distance is greater. And in these cases, it might also help to shoot more wide open to keep the background behind your subject a little bit more blurry. Personally, I like to have a lot of my subject or all of my subject in focus and also when multiple birds or multiple subjects enter the frame, I like to have them all sharp. So my go to aperture is anywhere between 5.6 and f11 depending on the lens I'm using as well. Sometimes if it gets really dark, I will also shoot more wide open at like f4 or f2.8. But in most cases, I think shooting between f5.6 and f11 gives you the best results with f8 usually being the sweet spot. And there's another reason you may want to stop down your lens, especially if you're using a cheaper zoom lens like the Sigma or Tamron lenses. But even a lens like a new Nikon 180 to 600 millimeter lens also benefits from stopping down. Because a lot of these zoom lenses are actually a little bit sharper stop down. So if your lens is wide open at f6.3, you often see a significant increase in sharpness and image quality if you stop down to f8, for instance. If you don't believe me, just try it out. You might be surprised. So my go-to aperture, if I can, is usually f8. And if it's darker, I usually open up a bit more to like f5.6 or f4 if I have to. And if I have more light available and I know I want more of my subject in focus, then I often stop down to even f11. And also remember, the closer to your subject, generally the more you have to stop down. And the further away your subject is, the less you have to stop down. There's another setting I think every photographer should at least try once in their life. Some will love it, some will hate it, but it's definitely something that a lot of pros use, including me. 
I'm talking about back button autofocusing. That basically means that you're disabling the focusing function on the shutter button. So the shutter button is only there to take photos and then you assign the focusing to one or more buttons in the back of the camera. Let's give you a very simple example and then I also give you an in the field example. Let's say you want to take a photo of an out of focus background. That basically doesn't work if you're using shutter button focusing because whenever you defocus your camera and then press the shutter button, it will instantly focus again on your background giving you a sharp photo. Whereas if you decouple the focusing from the picture taking, you can fully manually unfocus, have an out of focus background, press the shutter button and it will take a photo of this out of focus background. Now you might say, why would I take a photo of an out of focus background? That's not very useful and you're right. So let's look at another example. For instance, you're at the nesting site or the kingfisher perch and you want to capture the bird just before it lands on your perch. So normally you would pre-focus somewhere just on the perch or just behind the perch. And then when the bird comes in, you would simply fire away and hope that you get a nice shot. Now this can work with shutter button focusing, but oftentimes what will happen is that the moment you're pressing the shutter button, the camera will start focusing again. And because the bird's not in your frame yet, or only part of the bird is in the frame, the camera will go right past your perch and onto the background. If you're used to shutter button autofocusing, it's definitely not an easy task to retrain your hands and your brain to use the back button autofocus. But if you can do it and you need to give it at least a few weeks to try out and kind of retrain your hands, I think it will be of much benefit to you in the field because you can now much easier do things you couldn't do before in the field, for instance, pre-focusing or focusing on certain things without then your camera refocusing just before you're taking a photo. Back button autofocus can also be very helpful when you're using DSLR cameras because there we don't have the eye tracking autofocus we have in the new mirrorless cameras. And if you want to, for instance, put your subject in the corner, but your autofocus fields don't go all the way down there, you have to do something called focus and recompose. So you focus on your subject and then recompose your frame. However, if you have front button focusing available now and you press the button, very likely your camera will actually put the focus that's on your subject off to something else. And the only way to do the focus and recompose with a DSLR camera is actually to use the back button autofocusing because you can focus on your subject, recompose, and then take a photo with the front shutter button without your camera actually refocusing. Speaking about the autofocus, I don't want to talk about it for too long because I've made a lot of settings videos about how to set up your autofocus with different cameras and different brands. So check these out. I've also done some setup guides down there in the description for you guys that will help you to set up your cameras. But when it comes to modern mirrorless cameras, one thing you definitely want to activate on your camera is the eye tracking autofocus. Having the ability to have your camera simply jump onto your subject with the press of one button is amazing. And then your camera will track your subject all over the viewfinder, allowing you to fully focus on the composition and not to be so concerned with where to put your autofocusing field anymore, like you had to do with your DSLR cameras, for instance. Now we already talked about back button autofocus and I actually take it one step further with mirrorless cameras and use double back button autofocus. Where I set the base autofocusing mode in the camera to spot autofocus or single point autofocus that I can move all over the viewfinder similar to what you can do on a DSLR camera. And I focus by using one of the buttons on the back of the camera that I assigned for focusing with the single point autofocus. And that allows me to focus on whatever I want or if my camera gets stuck onto the background, I can quickly focus on my perch again, for instance, and get good results and can also pre-focus on whatever I want. And then on the second button in the back of the camera, I assign eye tracking. So whenever I press the button on the back of the camera, it will jump on my subject and track it all over the viewfinder. And that gives me the best of both worlds and again, more control over the camera. And as you can see, the more advanced you want to get with your photography, the more control you also have to exercise over your camera. And that includes using manual mode, back button autofocusing, and also assigning different autofocusing modes to the different buttons because it allows you that extra bit of control that then takes your photography to that next level. So if you want to get off to a great start with your wildlife photography, I think this is some of the settings that make the most sense to use. Either use manual mode and auto ISO or full manual mode if you dare to change your settings all the time and keep an eye on that histogram at all times. Then when it comes to the metering mode, I would set it to evaluative metering. 
And when it comes to the setting for shutter speed, I would either go between a four hundredth of a second and a thousandth of a second, depending what environment I'm shooting on and how much action I'm expecting my subject to do. And if you know there will be a lot of action, I would shoot between a two thousandth to four thousandths of a second as my minimum. And if you can, I would select a higher shutter speed. When it comes to the ISO, I would usually pick a range between 800 and 6400, also again depending on where you're shooting. If you're in a dark environment, you need that much higher ISO. If you're in a bright environment with a lot of sunlight, you can go a little bit lower, but I wouldn't go too low because chances are then your shutter speed will go too low and you might mess it up. Of course, you can also set your camera to auto ISO, that takes away some of the guesswork. And then when it comes to aperture, I would think of it as a creative tool. Generally speaking, I would always stop down a little bit because it will increase sharpness and it will also increase depth of field, meaning a more, lot more of your subject will be in focus. And then when it comes to handling your camera, I would definitely try to give back button autofocusing or even double back button autofocusing a try. And now to the most vital skill that everybody should learn that sounds so simple, but it's actually so hard to do in the field. What am I talking about? finding your bird or your animal or whatever you want to photograph in the viewfinder. To become an amazing photographer, you need to be able to rip up the camera to your face and by the time the viewfinder is on your eye, your subject also needs to be visible in that viewfinder. So what I'm saying is you need to develop the hand-eye coordination or lens-eye coordination. So whenever you lift up your camera, you already know where you have to point it without actually looking through the viewfinder so that when you bring your eye to the viewfinder, your subject is also in the viewfinder. Not finding your subject fast enough in the viewfinder is probably one of the main reasons that a lot of people miss crazy action shots. For instance, if you're photographing a Major Mitchell's cockatoo in the field, it will only have it crest up for about one or two seconds after it lands. So if you don't find the bird straight away after it lands, you will not got the shot with the crest up. I've seen this so many times in the field when I'm out with other photographers. They need to look through the viewfinder to actually find the bird, but if they don't find the bird right away, they start looking around through the viewfinder. And because the field of view is so narrow, especially with the big prime lens, by the time they finally find the bird, it's either long gone or the crest is down and the most crucial moment has been missed. So developing the ability to simply rip up the camera, point it at a certain spot, and by the time you have it at your face, have the subject in the viewfinder as well, is crucially important to learn. And you can simply exercise this skill at home or when you're bored out in the field, for instance. Simply think of a certain point, maybe a fence post or book in your bookshelf, then grab your camera, and without looking through the viewfinder, try and point the camera exactly onto that spot. And then when you look through the viewfinder, you should see through the viewfinder what you wanted the camera to point on. In the beginning, this will be quite difficult, but after a while, you will be able to lift up your camera. And by the time you look through the viewfinder, you see your intended target in the viewfinder. And that will make you a much, much better photographer because you will not miss these very crucial moments. Again, for instance, a bird suddenly diving right in front of you or an osprey flying past on the cliff and you only have a split second for you to actually see it, find it in the camera and then take some images before it disappears again. So this skill is crucially important and one that I would recommend for everyone to learn. And on that note, it's time to wrap up today's video. I hope you learned something new and if you didn't, I hope you at least enjoyed watching the video and I would love to hear from you guys in the comments what are the main struggles that you have when it comes to bird and nature photography. Also make sure to give me a thumbs up for the video, check out my channel membership and hit that subscribe button and I will see you in another video very soon. Bye guys!